Thanks for joining this episode of the number 86 lecture series, where we discuss the foundational principles of property law, as well as current topics in the academic literature. Today's episode features James Stern, professor of law at William and Mary Law School. His scholarship centers on property and private law theory and on intellectual property, privacy, and related issues. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. In another episode, we talked about some of the very basic, practical principles of property law. In this episode, I want to take more of a theoretical approach and ask some questions about how we think about property. How does property compare with other parts of private law? Property is an unusual or uh, distinct area in private law in a couple of different ways as compared to, say, contract or tort law. Um, unlike contract law, property rights apply in general to everybody. And uh, this is actually too, true in two different ways that are, that are easily mushed together, but that are worth noting uh, separately because they're both important. One of them is that the duties that property law imposes apply to, we say, the whole world. When I am the owner of Black Acre, I have rights against everyone in the world that they not trespass on my land. That's one aspect of it. That's not like contract at all. When you make a contract, it's just between the contracting parties. The other thing that's true about uh, property law is that it has this kind of historical continuity to it. My rights in Black Acre depend on what the person I got, I bought Black Acre from, uh, what their rights were, how good their title was, and so on and so forth going backwards. Um, so there's a sense in which it, this is different. My, uh, my claims, whatever it is, whatever the rights are that property law gives me, property is doing something that contract law isn't in the sense that it has to reconcile my rights as against everybody else's. Um, when I am the owner of something, that means I uh, am in the, I'm my, whatever my rights are, are paramount over the, uh, they defeat claims of others who would assert the same kind of authority. In contract law, you can have conflicting contracts, um, but in property, uh, and they, that, are, that are valid, in property law, you sort of can't have that. You can't have two different sort of pretenders to the throne, two different people who purport both to be the owner of Blackacre 100% separately. The legal system says, no, one of you is right and one of you is wrong. Um, so that's a major difference. That, that, uh, that is uh, operationally much more complicated. Tort law has the same property, the, I shouldn't say property, tort law has the same character of imposing duties on everybody else in the world, at least in a lot of situations. Um, just as someone can't trespass on, you know, on Black Acre, that's a right that's good against everybody. The same thing is true, say, in the law of battery, but it's much less complicated to know that because human beings are pretty standard. Um, we're all kind of the same and, and, a, and a general set of rules is in place there so that you don't really, it's not, it's not really as hard to know what is a trespass and what isn't. Um, and you don't have to, uh, there really aren't questions about who the, uh, who the right holder is in any kind of situation in tort. You know, you don't have to undertake a, a title search to figure out whether you're entitled uh, to, you know, whether you uh, are protected under the law of battery like you do in property. So property is in a different position there. It has much more um, complexity to it in that sense because it deals with things uh, on, a, on a global basis um, uh, with rights that are applicable to everyone that settles your claims to things, your title, on a basis that's, that's true against everyone. And, and where that's not an easy task. Tort law, the law of personal security within tort law, might sort of be doing the same thing, but the, the, but the, the, the problem is trivially easy there. Not so in property, which makes it much, much harder. Property is about stuff that you only have a kind of contingent relationship to, unlike, say, your physical body. Uh, and for that reason, it's much harder to know just what the boundaries of your rights are and, for any given thing, who the right holder is. So it gets pretty complicated. 
One way of thinking about the boundaries of property rights is the concept of right to exclude. Can you discuss what that means and why it's important? So one of the things uh, that property, people who write about property have looked at a whole lot is the, what is referred to as the right to exclude, the ability to prevent use of a particular resource by others. But in principle, you might have that within a contract. Right? Contracts can provide for exclusion in various ways on the one hand. And on the other hand, not all resources are really that well described by the language of excluding someone. What does it mean to exclude someone from uh, a, a shows in action? A shows in action is a, is a legal right to sue someone. Um, and you may be able to, to sell those um, or accounts receivable. What does it mean to exclude someone from accounts receivable? We get, I get what that means when it comes to Blackacre. It means you can't enter Blackacre, but you're not gonna enter accounts receivable. You're not gonna commit a trespass to accounts receivable. Now, maybe we can adjust the concept a little bit to, to get that in place. But what's really critical in the context of property and, and intangible assets uh, like that tends much more to be the question of who it belongs to. And so um, what can be helpful about recognizing this principle at work is just appreciating the extent to which titling problems of various kinds are central to the way property law plays out, to the rules of property law, to the uh, institutions that support it, um, and to the situations where a property solution to things is likely to be used. So the right to exclude is generally, it's a way of describing the right of an owner or other person with a, with a, with a property right to prevent use of the resource by others. And that uh, is generally manifest with land. We say, well, the right to exclude means you can't cross the boundary. You can't enter the column of space represented by land. The right to exclude you from personal property, generally we, we think that means don't touch it, don't use it. What's useful about the right to exclude as a concept is uh, I think two things in particular that it, that it helps us to see. One is that property tends to be, the duties that property imposes on people tend to be kind of bright line and boundary driven. A trespass is not, for the most part, a kind of highly contextual determination. It's a bright line rule. Cross this, it's, it might even literally be a bright line rule. Cross this boundary line and you've committed a trespass. If you stay on the other side, you haven't committed a trespass. It's simple and uh, kind of blocky like that. And we might think, well, it's an imperfect approximation for what it is that we really care about, which is interference with the owner's preferred use of, uh, of the resource, but it's a pretty darn good one. So that's one thing that's helpful about it is it, it, um, it captures this important kind of bright line quality of property law. The other thing that's helpful about it, although the language that's used is, um, I think, in some ways kind of poorly chosen, it gives people the wrong idea, um, property is fundamentally a matter of rights that are negative. And when I say negative, I don't mean they, um, they're in a bad mood or they're, they tend to be pessimistic. When I say they're negative, I mean that the duties that they impose on other people are duties of abstention, duties not to act in a particular way, as opposed to duties to act in some, in some particular way. Um, so whatever the owner's interests are that are protected through the law of property are only protected as against the undertaking of particular actions. Other people in the world are told they not to do stuff. They're not told there's anything they actually have to do. So if I wanna build a house on my property, I can't, through the law of property, command that other people come and help me do that. All I can do through the law of property is demand that they not get in the way of my doing that, that they not enter the, the property. And that's, uh, that's an important feature of property law. And one of the reasons why that exists is because property law, property rights apply on such a broad basis 
uh, to everyone in the world. They're a kind of default set of rights, uh, background set of rights that, that, that apply to everybody. And it would be very hard to have a system of um, affirmative duties that are imposed on others. But leaving that aside, it's just a useful, um, it's a useful thing in the first place to realize that um, in general, the duties that are imposed by property law are negative ones. They're duties to refrain from acting, not duties to do anything in particular. It can be helpful to talk about the right to exclude, but there are also some unhelpful aspects of talking about it that way. One way in which it can be unhelpful is that it can give a misleading picture of what property is about, what property is about by suggesting that property is this kind of nasty enterprise where what you're dealing with is, as opposed to inclusion, you're excluding people all the time. And it's not really about that. It's not different, say, from the law of, uh, of battery um, in the sense of being a negative right, a, a right that other people, um, other people shouldn't hit you. But it isn't the case that other people have to come along and, and you know, have a positive duty to make you look good or feel good or, or whatever else um, uh, as you walk down the street. Um, that that would be equally untenable and that the feature that we're talking about with exclusion, um, that's sort of, you know, that's analogous to the law of battery. Don't touch people without permission. That's a kind of bright line rule. Um, and it's a negative rule. It's a don't rule, not a do rule. Um, so that can get lost, however, in describing it as a, a right of exclusion. The other thing that can sort of lead you astray a little bit is um, I think, generally speaking, property rights, uh, a, a truer way to describe what's going on is that property rights confer control, or as they say, dominium uh, in, in uh, an older language of property, uh, over particular subject matters, over particular things. It gives the owner of a resource uh, or the holder of a property right the ability to allow or disallow particular uses of resources. Exclusion can give kind of the wrong sense of that and is sometimes a kind of a bad, um, a strange fit. It's odd to talk about excluding someone from uh, a diamond necklace, which is a small object. It's not like you're going inside it like you are if it's a piece of land. You know, you can actually, exclusion is a pretty good word for land because what you're doing is you're telling people to keep out. But a keep out, sign doesn't make much sense on a necklace. No one's going inside it. Um, that's even more true for intangibles like a, 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 a bank account or um, a claim of money that's owed to you. Um, what does it mean to say, keep out of that? Um, so I think it's it can be at least useful to think about an alternative way of formulating what we're talking about which is that what property entails are rights to control what's done with resources, rights to allow or disallow particular resources by the owner or by others. Can you elaborate on what you mean by that? What sort of alternative formulation might be helpful? So in an article I wrote called The Essential Structure of Property Law, I tried to figure out what it was that distinguished property rights from other kinds of rights. This is a question that, uh, it's a sort of theoretical question, but it's got some importance. And I sometimes describe it like this. If you're walking down the street and you ran into a legal right, how would you know whether it was a contract right or a property right? What are the, what are the hallmark features of property rights that, that make them that? And one of the things that people have talked about a lot in discussions of property is something people refer to as the right to exclude. And I suggested that the essence of property in an important way, the thing that really um, makes property systems distinct has as much to do with something I called the, uh, the mutual exclusivity principle than it does uh, the, a right of exclusion, which in some ways, in some ways that's a helpful concept, the right to exclude, and in other ways um, it can be kind of misleading. The mutual exclusivity principle is a basic assumption, presupposition of property systems that what the kinds of claims we're dealing with, the kinds of legal entitlements we're dealing with are, uh, are valid as against all other claimants. That is to say, it's a system where we reconcile 
we build into it the reconciliation of all competing claims. Now this, we may not do this administratively. It's possible that you can have on the books, you know, there can be mistakes out there where there are conflicting property claims, but that's a mistake. That's not the way it's supposed to be. So uh, in contract law, it's, I guess, sort of theoretically possible I could offer to sell you the Brooklyn Bridge and I'd actually be bound under that contract. I mean, maybe it's void as fraudulent or something like that. But, but generally speaking, um, the same person who offers to sell this, the same piece of property to two different people can be contractually bound to both of them and have to pay damages to both of them. But property law is not like that. Property law allocates stuff that's out there and tries to reconcile all these different claims among different people. That's why bankruptcy law operates at the interface of contract and property. That's where contract claims, or it's one place where contract claims, where you've basically promised the moon and the sky to others, you've, you've, you've promised to pay more money out uh, than you actually have, it gets brought down to earth, so to speak, and made real, it gets converted into property. And in, in a bankruptcy proceeding, you take the so-called property of the, of the debtor, the debtor's estate, um, you consolidate it all together and you try to pay off different claimants. And that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where uh, the claims of contract law, which are just personal as between different entities, um, even if it's a corporation, it's personal in the sense that it's not attached to particular resources. Um, you try and what bankruptcy does is it converts those into actual stuff. And once you've got property rights in it, those property rights are good against the world. They're actually, uh, they're a it's actually yours when you get paid out of the bankruptcy estate. And you can see a system like this in a lot of different areas, some of which we'd call property, some of them we might not, but think of, think of uh, a telephone exchange. It just won't work if two people have the same phone number. I mean, they could share a line, but like at some point you've got to stop that. You can't have uh, multiple houses on the, on the same street uh, that are assigned the, the same number. At least the system won't work the way uh, we want it to now. You can't assign different people the same web domain name that won't work either. All of this is kind of, that basic approach is baked into property. Property takes stuff that's out there, it allocates it among people, and it determines on a conclusive basis that one person's claims are, are superior to other people's uh, claims in the same resource. It has a much wider scope of concern than is the case with contract law. Contract law in any particular dispute is concerned with the rights of the parties between each other. Property law is concerned with rights on a kind of a global basis. It ultimately seeks to resolve really who is at the end of the day in charge of this particular resource. So that's the mutual exclusivity uh, uh, principle. It is one of the chief reasons why property potentially presents tremendous complexity and, and a property law system responds to that complexity by trying to simplify the rules. Sometimes that simplification can be kind of hard as uh, first year law students will find out, um, but it's uh, at the end of the day, it's still simpler than it would be if the rules weren't simplified and you had a much more uh, you had a proliferation of different uh, 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 approaches to property law. So I think there are lots of different features that are explicable in the system of property once you have this concern in focus. Once you realize, among other things, that the information costs that are imposed on others because the system seeks to be so universal in figuring out people's claims, the information costs can be really quite staggering. Um, it's the reason that we have devices out there to reduce information costs, like the recording office um, or other kinds of titling mechanisms. So you've got a place to go, like with a web domain name, you can go and look up and see, has this name been claimed? Is there someone who has it? And by the way, who is it? I'll go find them. But there's a, there's a definitive resolution of that, a central clearinghouse that, that, uh, that answers that question because you gotta know whose is it at the end of the day. You can't have multiple people uh, with valid claims to the same web address. In terms of practical applications, it helps explain again and again where these different 
informational demands within the property system come from and um, helps explain why it is that you need to have the kinds of institutional responses that we frequently see within the law of property, like title recording, like uh, deed re registries, uh, title recording, things like this, uh, why, pe why there's concern with uh, title insurance, and how you draw the line between what property and contract is. At the end of the day, the essence of a property right is that it assigns control in particular resources, not uh, as against uh, two individual parties, but on a kind of a wholesale basis. It's not personal in that sense. And there are a whole raft of different places in the law where you've got to figure out just what is property. Constitutional law is one. Bankruptcy law is another. Tax law. Um, a whole range of different areas where uh, there are rules that apply to property. Property is just a, for example, a, a textual element in a legal provision. And you've got to be able to figure out whether something is or isn't property. And um, the mutual exclusivity principle, looking out for these hallmark features, helps to answer that question and helps you see when we're talking about rights that are on the property side of things versus merely contract uh, or tort um, on, on the other. Uh, with tort, it's a, it's, it, there may be a slightly different basket of considerations that come into bear. Tort tends not to be, unless we're talking about property torts, which you can think of as kind of part of the law of property. Um, unless we're talking about property torts, we're not dealing with rights and resources that are external to ourselves. Uh, and so that, uh, you know, that is the kind of dividing line there. Um, so that's the basic, uh, that's the basic concept. And um, I think it's, it's helpful in coming at those kinds of questions. And it's just helpful in general in understanding why property law plays out the way it does. What are its basic concerns? And um, what's at the heart of what the legal system has to deal with with property, which is as often as not, it's with title disputes and questions like that as much as it is with questions about whether something's a trespass or a nuisance or, 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 or a questions along those kinds of lines. What's a violation versus not a violation? Um, a lot of it is um, how do we figure out whose this is? How do we figure out whether a particular claim on a resource is valid or not? One more question about how scholars talk or think about property rights. Can you explain the bundle of rights theory? Is it useful or not? So one of, one of the things that people debate in at least the literature about property these days is something referred to as the bundle of sticks or bundle of rights metaphor. And like a lot of things in one's study of the law, this is a kind of, it has a, a two-edged sword. It's got its pluses and it's got its minuses. The bundle of rights metaphor um, is, uh, can often be used as a way of explaining the ways in which uh, property rights differ from in different contexts so that property in different kinds of resources is a little bit different. So we say, uh, water law gives you one bundle of rights and uh, oil and gas law gives you a slightly different bundle of rights as an owner. Ownership uh, in those different kinds of contexts looks a little bit uh, different from each other. Um, and it also can refer to the ways in which uh, individuals customize their, uh, their, their rights and property. So if you start out with that big uh, the, the kind of the, the whole pizza pie of ownership. It may be that the owner um, then gives different pieces of the pie to different people. Might, the owner might grant an easement to a neighbor. The owner might mortgage the property, giving a security interest to uh, a bank. Um, and the, the bundle of rights can explain or is a way of describing uh, the way in which a, a, a particular right or stick from within this imaginary bundle has been given to someone else. And that's all well and good. Now, of course, we could say that about other things as well, um, other kind of areas of law, but um, uh, you know, no area of law is without differentiation in different contexts, um, but fine. Um, there's a different version of the bundle of rights or bundle of sticks uh, metaphor, though, that's also out there and that um, I think can be quite misleading and, um, and do some damage in people's understanding of things. And that's maybe better encapsulated by the phrase, property is just a bundle of rights. 
it's just a bundle of sticks. And you hear that a lot too. And the idea there is, well, because property can vary in these different ways, it's therefore infinitely plastic. You can do with it whatever you want. Um, it has no necessary form. It doesn't have to uh, have any common elements and it can be changed at will, willy nilly. Now it's a deep issue in the law of property, how much uh, change should be accommodated across time compared to the expectations of owners and the need for stability. There's that, that's a basic fundamental um, theme in property laws, this need to strike a balance. And often the bundle of rights is invoked as a way of just of saying, you can do whatever you want. There isn't any there there. There are no basic features of property law. It's just, um, it's just there to be refashioned however you like it. And that I think is a kind of a, a non sequitur. It doesn't follow from the fact that there's some variation, that there's infinite variation, or that, um, uh, that there's, uh, there's nothing that can be said about the commonalities uh, in property law as compared to, uh, as compared to the differences. Um, uh, so, and, and this can particularly come up in situations where we're talking about protecting property, whether constitutionally or otherwise, the notion that property is just a bundle of rights tends to suggest you can sort of do whatever you want and there's never, uh, there's never any incursion of a protected interest there. Um, and that seems to me to prove too much. Um, any right can be broken down into sub rights. Your right not to be, uh, not to be battered or your right not to be, not to have malpractice committed against you by your doctor. These you could also describe as a bundle of different rights, um, but, uh, but we don't do that. Um, and it's sort of a, it's a rhetorical uh, move that's made with property that I think um, uh, can be damaging to people's uh, understanding of, of how it really works and what's going on. Thank you for listening to this episode of the number 86 lecture series on property law. The spirit of debate of our founding fathers animates all of the number 86 content encouraging discussion and critical reflection relative to how each subject is widely understood and taught in law schools and among law students. Subscribe to the number 86 lecture series on your favorite podcast platform to have each episode delivered the moment it's released. You can also go to fedsoc.org slash number 86 for lectures and videos on federalism, separation of powers, the judiciary, and more. Thanks for listening. See you in class.